Buonasera, welcome, bentornati, welcome back everyone, bentornati a tutti alla nostra serie Libriamo from Italy with Books. Today, May 3rd, we are celebrating the release of Italian Lessons, 50 Things We Know About Life Now, a new book by Beppe Severnini, translated by Anthony Sugar. And we are truly happy and honored to have uh, both of them with us tonight. I am Chiara Durazzini, uh, the event coordinator at I Am Books, the Italian and Italian American bookstore here in Boston, in the North End. The series Libriamo from Italy with Books is organized in partnership with Friends of Italian Cultural Center Boston. Um, and is under the auspices of the Consulate General of Italy in Boston. Uh, the series focuses, focuses on uh, conversation with Italian authors whose work are being released in their English uh, translation. Uh, let me here introduce our first guest, who is our consul, Federica Sereni, and then we will go into our conversation. Buonasera Federica, buonasera console. How are you? Ciao Chiara, buonasera a tutti. Uh, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, I think that, you know, uh, the pandemic did have one, if, the, if, if only one, but it had one positive effect, and that, that is the ability of joining people uh, that are far apart physically, but they're able to join forces and have events such as this one. So thank you, Beppe, and thank you, Anthony, Anthony for being here tonight. Um, I am very, very curious to hear about your book, Beppe. I know that the lessons will be um, interesting, uh, and you have... I'm sure taught many of us many things about our own country in the past years with your, with your books. I have learned um, many, many details about my own country from the way you describe us. And I think it's always interesting uh, to, to see your perspective. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Anthony. We worked together before. And thank you, Kat, Chiara and Diane Books for the wonderful opportunities to be together and I hope you all enjoy the, the event and I'm sure it will be interesting and entertaining. Grazie a tutti e buonasera dopo. Thank you so much, Consul Sereni. Always a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, let me first of all thank uh, from the bottom of my heart our sponsor Fitch B, Friends of Italian Cultural Center Boston, um, whose mission is to establish a hub of Italian culture and preserve our rich Italian heritage by creating programs like this. So thank you so much. Um, now let's get to our guests, Anthony and Beth. I'm going to read very quickly a short version of your bios, if you don't mind. Uh, so Anthony is a writer uh, and translator from the Italian and the French. I didn't know about the French. He translated dozens of articles for the New York Review of Books and close to 40 novels for Europa editions. He has translated many novels that were awarded Italy's the highest literary award, the Premio Strega. Um, in the realm of Italian noir, aside from some of the work of Gianfranco Carofiglio, he's also translated books by many of the leading figures in the field, Massimo Carlotto, Sandrone Dazieri, Maurizio De Giovanni, and uh, the late Giorgio Faletti, Antonio Manzini, and others. He's received two National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship, and he has translated TV series and movies for HBO, Netflix, and Amazon. Whoa! And let's get to Beppe Severnini. He's a columnist and an editor at Corriere della Sera, which he joined in 1995. He was the editor-in-chief of its weekly magazine, Seven, 
from 2017 to 2019, and he created the blog Italians in 1998. He was a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times between 2013 and 2021. His writing has appeared in the Sunday Times, the Financial Times, and The Economist, where he was the Italy correspondent from 96 to 2003. He's the author of many books, including Ciao America, An Italian Discovers the US, and La Bella Figura, that is very well known, A Field Guide to the Italian Mind, off the Rail, A Train Trip Through Life, that was published, published in 2019. And today, May 3rd, we have Italian's Lessons, 50 Things We Know About Life Now. Let me add that Mr. Severnini was made an officer of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II, and in 2011, the President of Italy conferred on him the title of Commendatore in the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic. He lives near Milan with his wife and he has a granddaughter, Agatha. Are you in Milan, Beppe? I am in Milan. I am missing my granddaughter. She spent the morning with me. I was writing and she was next to me. And for the first time, I put a book in her hands. Actually, it was a Tony, it was a German-English vocabulary, a tiny one, because she's only five weeks old. And so all I could do is like a really super tiny box. And I took pictures and uh, it's actually her first book. And it's, uh, I, I admit that, you know, a, a German-English vocabulary to a five weeks old baby is probably a little far-fetched, but she looked beautiful and she slept so well up with her vocabulary in her hands. <laughs> Perfect. Well, so I'm going to start by just pointing out um, a couple of paradoxes because your book is full of paradoxes, um, and it's as if as if there's a there's a forma mentis, a, just a shape of the mind. When you write about things, you especially like a paradox. You like something that has two faces to it. I'm in a very Italian a town with a strong history of Italian immigration. Um, which is San Diego. And this is being broadcast, though you're in Milan, from another town with a strong Italian history, which is Boston. And those two towns are about as far away as you can get. One's at the far northeast tip and the other's the southwest tip of the United States. The Italians came to them both. Um, the, your first book, uh, Ciao America, is an Italian... Mm, doing the declension of America, trying to describe America to Italians, and then, interestingly, reversing it back and describing Americans to themselves as seen by an Italian. And this one is as far away from that as you can get, which is describing a, a sea change in Italian mindset and culture and you're describing them first, you describe it to America and then uh, to Italy and then to America. So I'm just wondering, is it interesting to you to work on this almost face of a mirror, this, this reflection between two cultures? Does that give you a special kind of energy, a fertile you know, kind of way of thinking about the world? I knew, Tony, that you were... Uh a very proficient and smart translator. I didn't know you were such a good interviewer because this is a, a perfect first question. And the short answer is yes, absolutely. I play this game and I think it works. It shows, first of all, that I like the nations and the cultures I write about. My advice to younger, younger writers is never to write about people and cultures and places you don't like. If you don't like something, leave it alone. I like America, I criticize in America. I went berserk when I uh, recently with the pressure president, I, I, I do not name, I just, uh, one of my video for Corriere della Sera today was about uh, 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 Tucker Carlson, so you can imagine. So <laughs> not that I, yes, it was, you can look it up. I mean, I just, I put it, uh, was on, went online with Corriere della Sera the, in Italian, the, uh, the alto prelato del trampismo. Uh, 
it's uh, it's not everything that about America that I like, but who cares? No, not I do not approve or like any everything about Italy, but who cares? I like America, I like Italy, I like England, and I think that if you tr have traveled a lot, you know, I've been, I don't know how many times to San Diego and probably as many times to Boston. I have so many memories. I won't bring them up from my fellowship at MIT and my visit and the consulate and, and, and motorhome with my parents and my son and this and that. I'm old. I don't want to bother you with this, but I, so there is so many in my life that brings me together with the places of my life that I think it would be silly to declare some of them sort of unpleasant or, and I use all of these to create something that the readers can understand and play with. I think thinking is a form of playing. And I think especially reading is a form of playing, is, is, a, is a smart way of playing with ideas, with people. And uh, let me add something. Uh, uh, today, just now, basically, live on Italian television, I had a quite a lively, let's put it this way, I've, I've been living in Britain for a long time, so I'm very good at understatement, lively discussion with a Russian journalist, live, and she would, she was extraordinary. I mean, everything she said was, I mean, I, it was hard to believe that she was serious. Even when I asked her, do you really believe that your foreign minister the other day, Lavrov, said on Italian television that, that hit Adolf Hitler was a Jew? And it's not surprising because some of the Jew can persecute other Jews. It's like, it's so extraordinarily silly. Only. It's like, of course, you're going to say that you're, you're foreign minister. And she even denied that. So, but at the end of this extraordinary one hour of television, I ended up with an invitation to, to take part of a program on Russian television. And my wife and Agatha's mom, so my daughter-in-law, they, they said, no way you're going to back to Russia now. Uh, and please, please don't. And uh, oh, actually, I love to. I, I even speak some Russian. I use my, you love languages, Tony. I use my Russian today. Uh, at the end of a long speech full of extraordinary statements, I said in Russia, Etana pravda, i voi It means it's wrong, it's false, and you know it. I love that. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's um, at, at the end of all this, um, I told her, Yulia was her name, look, I mean, I think all this happening is crazy and is atrocious for the Ukrainians. And I think it's very sad for you too, because you are, you have a man in charge, obsessed and dangerous, but nonetheless, do not dare to say that I don't like Russia or the Russians. I live there. I know the country. I have two books translated into Russia. If you, I mean, my honeymoon was in Russia, even Russia, I think I can approach even now with the right heart, which doesn't prevent me from saying that what Putin is doing is absolutely monstrous, but he's a leader. I'm talking about a nation, which actually is, I think is, is, is an hostage now of, of such a man. Mm. So sorry for the long answer, but yes, absolutely. I love to play different cultures, but the, the starting point and the bottom line is I like people and I like nations. I think the word is fantastic because it's different. If all the world was exactly like Boston, San Diego, or Milan, or Moscow, uh, that would be a real problem. Actually, if it was all like Moscow, even a bigger problem. But... That was a great answer. Thank you very much. You should go to Russia if you feel safe doing it, but uh, uh, it can be tricky. Um, so the last time that we worked together and talked about a book, it was about a book, um, Your Inordinate Love of Trains, which I share. I grew up uh, going to my grandmother's house in Manhattan Beach, and there was a, a train track literally next door. And I remember we, I would wake her up to open the, wind, open the blinds so I could watch the trains go by. Um, your 
there is there is a connection here and i see a certain uh glimpse into your soul with it um i was thinking about it and i kind of realized in in a joking way that um well the the wonderful name for an italian apartment building is a palazzo italians all live in a palace um, but there is also the fact that when you say casa in Italian, it doesn't necessarily mean house. It often means apartment building. Um, and I suddenly realized, you know, an apartment building, uh, a train is an apartment building laid flat for shipping. Um, the, there's a great similarity between a tall apartment. As a matter of fact, in the old days, trains even had balconies. And I've sadly missed the balcony at the end of a train. Do you feel that a country that lives in close proximity, either in houses around a piazza or in apartment buildings with balconies that look out on each other where famously many people were singing, is there something particular about that way of living? And another thing that you talk about in the book is how Italians see people. They see them directly without in an immediate fashion. So this interaction between people and the pandemic, can you kind of address how those two things came together? Wow. Uh, well, Italians, I mean, I like people. I'm Italian. Italians like other people, basically. I mean, uh, in, in, uh, I think talk shows <laughs> were invented on Italian trains. If you sit on an Italian train, I've been traveling on American trains a lot. In 2002, I took a train from, from uh, um, Portland, Maine. Then first stop was Boston. Then we went forward west to, to the west to Portland, Oregon. It took us almost a month. It was an amazing journey that he described in the book in Off the Rails. And then the next year with my son, I went from Washington, D.C. to Washington State, going south we went through louisiana and then texas and uh, in and san diego and then up so it and i i know the difference italian and uh, i mean um, american trains i had to ask <coughs> questions italian trains i have to answer questions first because quite a few people know me so i have to ask answer question nonetheless i'm often on television but because italian love to share experience here. We are, a, you know, the social network were invented in Italy before they actually existed. And the pan let's go to the pandemic, which is a starting point of the book, but let's be clear, Italian Lessons is not a book about the pandemic. It's a book that started from the pandemic to reflect and think how we are and what have we, we know about life now, things we can teach. I think every nation can teach something. Every nation must learn something. And I am sure an American writer could actually write a book called American Lesson, 50 Things We Know About Life. Now, there will be probably different things. And so I'm not saying that we are the... You remember the beginning of this amazing TV series, one of the best I've seen, 10 years old now, in the newsroom. Do you remember that? Yes. Anyone seen the newsroom? The opening scene in the university when the girl, uh, like a sophomore or something, asked uh, Will McEvoy, uh, why are we the greatest country on the, in the world? And the answer is, we're not. And I love that because I don't think there isn't a single greatest country in the world. All countries are wrong and all countries are defective and all countries are great. And I think, I think our consul is with us and I'm sure she agrees with me. I think you love your country, and you, but you never, you never go around saying, oh, we're the best and everybody, everyone is, is, you know, should learn. But there is something that we can teach the world. One thing, and uh, well, I'll answer your question, is that the pandemic was painful for Italians for two reasons. One is historical, medical, geographical, that after China, COVID hit Italy, and to be exact, ex where I live, Codogno, Lodi, Crema, Bergamo, Cremona. So we were, we 
we experienced COVID before everyone else. When I wrote it in one of my um, sort of op-ed uh, uh, sort of stories for the New York Times, I remember I was describing what's going on to my colleagues in New York, and they thought it was all, you know, very exotic to the point of bizarre. And in fact, after a few months, we were all experiencing the lockdowns, the stress, the fear, and all that. But we started end of February 2020 to lock the lockdown for Italians were more was more painful than for any other culture society that I know for one simple reason because we love to share time and conversation and and, phys and experience with other people we are social people I mean I don't want to it's not a lack of respect for the Finns but in in northern Lapland if you lockdown actually is not a, a huge deal because they live like 50 miles from each other but in Italy we live together we talk to each other we are, we're not on the balcony we were on the street in a piazza or on the phone so for us it was painful we are essential can I say central or sensuous what is Tony you help me sensual yeah since As a well. translator, I could give you a very long and meandering answer, no, me um, but I, I think that sensual is fine. We we love the good things in life is maybe the, you know, the easier way to say it. Okay. It's great to, to, to do this a webinar with your translator. Well, the, I always say there's no such thing as an untranslatable word. It might take an entire volume to translate one word, but it can be translated. No, but we we don't have the time, and I'm, no, I'm absolutely and I not. But, uh, but you're a, you're you love you're a people of senses. You love the, the experience. You're tactile. You know, people have Google. I have Tony Sugar. <laughs> How lucky I am! Uh, you can put that in your bio. People, have I will Google. put that in my bio. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> One uh, of our attendees is, is suggesting sensory. Sensory is a good one, but it's what what Beppe is is leaning on is the love. It, the 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 senses want their part. It is um, sensuous is definitely tends a little bit towards sexy, and sensual no. tends towards um, a certain voluptuousness. No, but if I certainly say, that, but you can certainly say that, sensual. Senses, five senses. Exactly, all five people. senses. We slap people on, you know, we, we tend to touch people, not as much as the Brazilians, but definitely more than the Americans or other cultures. We tend to hug people, touch people. We love to smell, to taste, to, to we, we lead, and to, to be- And you like to argue, you like to- Of course. And you like to argue, and it's a friendly thing to interrupt people like I just did to you, for which I apologize. One of my 50 reasons is that you remember you have the list there. It says in, everywhere they see, they look at you, in Italy they see you. I think that's absolutely crucial. It's one of the 50 reasons. Everywhere they look at you, in Italy they see you. There is a huge difference between looking and seeing, and seeing and sight is another sense. It's, it's when I'm talking about, you know, touching, smelling, tasting. Uh, hearing and watching and uh, we see people. So th the pandemic took all of that away. It was a terrible mm. time, a, a big challenge, not only from a medical point of view and the social point of view, but also from a psychological point of view. I mean, I'm not saying that it was not dramatic for people, you know, people, people lost their relatives, their friends, and, and some went into hospital, but luckily came out of it. But on the whole, as a nation, we were, we learned a lot of ourselves. Like, we had time to think. I wrote a book because I had plenty of time to think, who are we? What have we become? Are we different from the time when I was writing La Bella Figura in 2005, 2006? Yes, we are. I think 15 years is a long time and there are new Italians. And I think this book is, is um, as interesting as La Bella Figura. I hope it's as successful as La Bella Figura. Tony, can I tell you something? And actually, I'm going to tell you and, and everybody 
who's watching us, do you see a column here on my left? Do you see it behind yes. me? Okay, a pillar actually. Yes, I do. Do you see that uh, there are words written on it? Yes, the, the, okay. the black lines, which I can see if I look carefully are words, yes. Okay, those words are the lead of La Bella Figura. They were ah. pa painted, painted by a painter. I've never used that as a background in any, it's just a coincidence, but probably there are no coincidences that I'm sitting here when I was, because I, that, I was so lucky with that book and that book did so well that uh, immediately I had to, to, re, to restore, refurbish, redo my flat in Milan. And the money was more than enough to do it. To, to, <laughs> to, and so I decided to have to say thank you to that book. And so I wrote the, the lead. I asked a painter to write the lead. He started, it, to be Italian is a full-time job. And he started from there. That's very nice. Um, the, the, uh, a friend of mine, a translator who's no longer with us named William Weaver, who was also a journalist and an author, um, did very well from translating the name of the rose and built an addition to his house in Monte San Sabino, uh, near Arezzo. And he called it the echo chamber in honor of, uh, Umberto Eco. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, you were saying it's not about the pandemic, and in a way it's not about the pandemic, and yet I feel as if this book is a particularly philosophical book about the nature of life and the nature of people, and maybe it's the result of two pandemics, the aftermath of two pandemics, the pandemic of, uh, of COVID, but also the pandemic of the internet, which has only separated people. It's brought them together, but in many ways it's separated them. Um, I almost feel as if it's metaphysics, but it's it's not abstract in any way. We I was talking earlier with Chiara, and we came up with the idea of maybe it's not metaphysics, but meta journalistics, because it's so observed. It's very well observed. But what changes are you talking about having seen? What things have you noticed when you talk about the new Italians? What makes these new Italians new? How have they changed? And is it unique to Italy? Or is it something that the world, which has also gone through these two twin pandemics, the internet and COVID, uh, have also been come out of and in some way modified? Okay, let's play a game. Okay, you got those 50 reasons in front of you. I saw the, right? In a very, yep. in, okay, in paper, good old paper. We could put them on the screen, or we like it this way. Okay, why don't you read them? Uh, would you like me to read them? No, one by one, and I tell you whether these would apply like to, to 2005, 2006, like something that I've seen before, like in the early, at the beginning of the century, and Very things good. change. I just go. Sounds like a good game. Let old me start. New, old Number new. one. Number one, because when everyone expects us to lose our cool, we find our strength. Reasonably new, we realize that we're stronger than we can, uh, we, we knew. We were actually the first to be surprised by the Italians were, uh, were the Italians. We didn't know we would be so good. We looked at each other and said, are we really that cool? Yes, we are, when we want. Number two, because we're vulnerable when we think we're tough and vice versa. Old. Old story, same, same old story. Number three, because we can be serious about things, but we hate to admit it. Absolutely, that, that is, has always been like that, but even more so. I mean, when I tell people, I mean, uh, today, uh, tonight, uh, Lily Gruber at the end of this um, talk show brought up the cover of the book of Italian Lesson and said, congratulations, Beppe, today is a birthday of the new, new book in America. Oh, he says here, 50 things we know about. Are you going to teach Americans a few things? And I realized that I had to, to sort of almost apologize because the, the, the bottom line, we Italians, I mean, there are people that, countries and cultures where they really are offended when foreigners say that they are not, they, they have faults and shortcomings. We are exactly the opposite. 
we feel we are outraged when people say we are good and reliable. How so? <laughs> We're not reliable. We are absolutely unreliable. We are a little mad. We are, you know, the, 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 the jokers of the world. In fact, Italians tend to be, re and the Italians that are successful in the world, and in Boston, I could name at least 10, since we're talking Boston, and I met them there, and I know how successful they were, most in universities, but not only universities, had this combination of being reliable and serious and trustworthy and being bright and, and intuitive and, and brilliant. If an Italian who can bring these two things together is amazing. Those Italian who think that to be to be uh, lively and bright and impressive is enough, they're wrong. Because people are scared by our excessive intuition and, and, and good humor and life, and the fact that we are lively. We don't realize how much we scare people. Yeah. I'm going to skip right to number six, because it's, I know it's one of my favorites. Number six, because the rest of the world looks at you, Italians see you. Now, we've talked about this before, but I, I, there is something so central to the Italian way that they'll see you. And I know, I remember when I first went to Italy, I was shocked because people would ask, how are you? And I would say, I'm fine. And they say, well, you don't look fine. You look a little tired. Have you been getting enough sleep? And are you eating right? And did you know that your belt and your socks are supposed to match and yours don't? And uh, some other things I'd like to tell you. And I'm like, whoa, usually when they ask the question, they don't really want the answer. And when they look at you, they don't really see you. It can be uncomfortable, but it's one of the things I prize most about Italian culture. So do you wanna talk about that one for a second? Oh, you did it so well. I, I have a little, very little to add, but it's true. You know, my English friends, even America, even more so my English friend, British friends, uh, uh, they ask you, you know, how are you? And they were shocked to, 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 to realize that people went into the, the, the digestive history in, in answering and say, why is are these people? I mean, I'm asking, how are you? And this person is actually telling me how he or she is. Uh, and uh, no, it's, um, I mean, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think I use the, use, I use the example of police in the book. I mean, uh, and uh, like, I think I start from a sad, dramatic story about even happening in the US. I mean, I lived in the US, I don't want to go into a sort of a lecture about policing and all that. I know how sensitive it is. But it's a fact that even relation between the police and the general population in Italy is different. You look at a policeman like a, a street patrol and a driver, and it's like it's a piece of theater. It's not threatening. It's not that one is scared, the other is threatened. No. Uh, the, the, the driver is actually an actor or an actress, and he comes up with the most extraordinary excuses in order not to admit what is pretty obvious that he was speeding. And, and in Italy, it's like a, it's a happening. It's like a theatrical starting eight in the morning and ending late at night. And I think what foreigners like about Italy is that somehow we, every actor is important, everyone. Uh, you don't have to be the main character. Every actor is important in Italian play. And if you are a foreigner, you come to Italy, you, you're part of the play. Uh, and, uh, and I could see how that, that is mentally healthy. Okay, can I put this way? Yeah, well, I remember one of my early experiences when I came to Italy, it was in Perugia in the, uh, the Corso. Uh, and I was sitting outside of a... Um, of a, of a cafe a table and there were men who were taking the 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 corso is laid with six foot long two foot wide one foot deep slabs of like pietra serena it's like a blue stone it's beautiful stuff that's probably been there and they were they were laying new ones 
And they were using chisels and hammers. They had little newspaper hats and blue um, overalls. And they were talking to each other and chipping away. And it sounded like the Anvil Chorus. And it was somehow such a majestic, beautiful piece of theater, this giant piece of stone, these people chipping away, the sound, the musical sound, and, and people stopping and commenting and interacting. I have never seen such theater. So I totally agree with you. I'm going to go straight to two questions, to two little uh, number 21 and number 23. I know they're both dear to your heart. And this is just a little bit about Italy because Rome is a story to itself. That's number 21. And then because I know it's very dear to your heart because Sardinia smells like patience. So would you like to talk about those two places? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, Rome, uh, um, I love Rome. Uh, it's uh, a capital city. It's one of the most extraordinary. I, I've seen a lot of countries. I, I worked out the other day that I've been in 98 countries in the world, which is quite a lot. And That's some of lot. them, and, and some of them many, many times, 10 times in China, 12 in Russia. I don't know how many in the United States starting. When was that? Uh, he, I walked. So about 45 years ago, can you imagine? I was a baby <laughs> in the States. And so, uh, and, uh, and I do believe that Rome is in the actual, is not, is not a commonplace, one of those stereotypes. Rome is absolutely stunning, even to us coming from Northern. The problem is that Romans do not have the sort of the stamina or the self-confidence. That's a key word that we do have in Milan or New Yorkers or even Bostonian, I think. Romans, they, they want to show great self-confidence, but in fact, they're full of doubts in, in their capacity of running a modern city in and, and they hide all that behind a kind of facade of cynicism. I know all that. I love Rome. I have friends there. I go there often. I like, and I tend to forgive all these. But I think that has been a real drawback because Rome has got everything to be not only a beautiful, welcoming city, but to be honest, is, there is a great song by the nationals called uh, Roman Holidays. Lovely song. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can you can walk around Rome, listen to that song, and it's beautiful. But if you live there, even for a short time, and no one takes your, the garbage away, you say, what, well, garbage, trash, I keep forgetting. What is it? Uh, we can say either one. Okay, garbage. And garbage no, truck. Garbage. It's a trash truck or a garbage truck. Again, okay, the, gar you, the garbage you, truck stays there. You, you, it is very risky to ask me questions like this, so let's just go on. Okay, I knew, but I like risk. I know, I knew exactly. I know there was a game. No, seriously. If, if no one picks up your garbage for a week, and then seagulls comes, and and uh, wild boars come, and it's actually happened. Really. And in the last few years, I don't know, 145. Uh, I would say though that is one large rat. Well, the. You get rats, but if you're getting wild boars, that's 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 taking rats one no, step up. Yeah. No, no, it's actually wild boars because they, yeah, they, that's, they, they are, they're, they're coming into Rome, and the extraordinary things that in the Romans are so used to have everyone coming into Rome. They have so many invaders in the last two thousand years True. that they find a way of convivenza, living with wild boars. They Coexistence, find, yeah. Um, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. But yes, so in my, in my one of the 50 reasons about Rome, I, I love Rome, but I think, I feel a little sorry for Rome and the Romans. Uh, my nieces, beloved nieces live there. And whenever we speak, they love the country. They're real Roman girls, but they say, why? I mean, you can be fantastic, but please take away our garbage. I mean, how is it possible that, that, that buses in Rome, 140 something, went on fire in the last few years? Mm -hmm. Obviously, they were set on fire. By whom? Why? It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's not funny. Sardinia is, uh, is yeah. 
Sardinia. It's amazing. It's, it, the smell, the color, the sea. Uh, again, I've been traveling everywhere and I never seen beaches. The number, sheer number of stunning beaches and water and everything. And it's a huge island. So there are never too many people anywhere. And they're tough. They're small. They're, they're concise, as I say. And I love Sardinia after my own Lombardy is the region that I know best. And I am, and I love Sardinians and Sardinia, and I'm reciprocated. They always, they gave me a literary award reserved to Sardinian. And when I come, and I say, I'm not Sardinian, I say, shut up. You love the island enough and you deserve this. So here we are. I have, so I'm going to go to directly to number uh, 41. And this is a little bit of a translation a little bit of a translation question as well. Observation more than question. The number 41 is because we want home delivery and we love having shops downstairs and home delivery versus shops downstairs. It's clear we're talking about a more modern and a more traditional way of getting our foods. But it's another thing which is um, sotto casa is an Italian saying and again, casa doesn't mean necessarily house. As a matter of fact, one of the most un mistranslated words from Italian is casa, because it usually means an apartment in an apartment building. And so sotto casa is literally downstairs. Um, and, but the thing is, there are so many small shops, small, so many small mom and pop shops in a large Italian city that you literally are talking about the house, the shop that's downstairs. Um, that observation to me is number one, language is shaped to describe the reality that that language lives in. But the, 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 the difference between Maybe, maybe even in New York, you don't always have a grocery store downstairs, not, a, not an Italian grocery store run by the people that own it. Um, can you talk a little bit about that interaction, the, the, the fabric, the network between shopkeepers and the Italian public, and then the modern changes in the economy little people riding around on Vespas delivering pizzas and, 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 uh, and food like that. You know, how is that changing Italy? Because okay. that's an old tradition, that of the, your local shopkeeper. And a little bit it's going away and a little bit it's staying. I'll answer your, your question in a moment, but I see there are plenty of questions. What shall we do? I'll ask our host. Shall we answer them uh, at the Absolutely. end? Or? Yeah, yeah, of course. We can take a little break and uh, and perhaps uh, we can uh, have our uh, no, questions. Like the first one, for example, is by D in the Q&A. Grazie al signor Sugar e a tutti i traduttori. Signor Severnini, I have always appreciated your cultural insights. I have two questions. First, is there any trend towards using subtitles in Italian, in Italian films and TV? Because maybe she's referring to the dubbing all the time. <laughs> it makes it much harder to learn Italian and must also be harder for those with hearing difficulties. Second, why does Italy publish relatively few books compared to the cultural sophistication of the populace? Is there any positive trend? Okay, uh, one by one. Uh, one by one. The first one is uh, it's sub Italian no. subtitles no. In, on TV. No, it's not happening. You know, translate. Uh, I, I if I watch like uh, 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 the, the, the Korean series or Korean film, I watch it in Korean and I pick the subtitles in English or Italian. If I watch a, a Dutch series undercover, Dutch, uh, actually a good series undercover, um, if you want to watch a good series, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll watch it in, in, in Dutch and, and I have subtitles in Italian. But the Italians refuse to have that system on television. I mean, the idea of 
of hearing different languages and reading is young people completely different. This will change not by law. That's a French way of doing things. You know, decide if you have a bill stating that you have to need to have subtitles. It doesn't work like that in Italy. But my son, my young colleagues, my nieces, my they they find me perfectly normal to listen to the original. They appreciate the, the beauty of languages and they are very happy with the English or Italian subtitles. So it's just a matter of waiting a few years and it's happening already. Yeah. But it hasn't I'll, I'll throw in a sub I'll throw in a footnote to that one, which is I remember being at a friend's house and uh, um, he was in the kitchen and uh, the TV was on and it was a movie. I forget who, the, what the answer to the question was, but from the kitchen, he called out, I can hear there's a movie on, but is that Robert De Niro, Al Pacino or Dustin Hoffman? Because I recognize the voice and what he <laughs> meant was the dubber. The actor was doing They're the dubbing. This, it's all the same all guy. Three. It was yeah. uh, Oreste, no, Lionel. Lionel, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a famous, everybody knows the dubber and everybody could recognize the voice, but we didn't know which of those three actors it was. That, to me, was a perfect encapsulation of the problem. Wasn't he a Mendola dubbing a lot of other Amendola, American Amendola actors? Was, yeah. Amendola, yeah, yeah. Second question. Um, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have ah. to answer the one second. Uh, just a, a, a footnote. I've interviewed both Dustin Hoffman and Woody Allen, and they both love the, the, uh, the uh, Lionel for his... The, the dubber, work. yeah. <laughs> I remember them mentioning it. Uh, Yes, and the second one, sorry, dubbing was one question, what was the other? The other is uh, that perhaps Italy doesn't publish uh, as many books uh, uh, compared to the intellect of Italians, the sophistication. Uh, Italian, Italy publishes far too many books, some of them should not be published, they are <laughs> a waste of paper, to be honest, and actually half of the book don't sell any copies, they are just vanity publishing, and it's... I. I spend my hobby and my daytime hobbies discourage people from from writing publishing writing books should be free and wonderful but publishing is a different thing if no one wants to buy my books I should just stop publishing them I could write them and uh, but I should not ask a superstar like Tony Schubert to translate them let alone to to, to inflict the American audience with my book. No, too many books. The problem is too many, not too few. And then <laughs> okay. very quickly the, about shop and shopkeepers. What's happening is that Italians always believe that home delivery, e-commerce and all that will never take, uh, sort of take root in Italy because I remember that 15 years ago, oh, it will never happen. And I will say, you're wrong. It will happen. Just give it time. We always come, we, we, we mistake the, 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 the difficulty of a new technology with the failure of that technology, okay? Simply, some technology took a little longer for different reasons, like home delivery, uh, take Amazon. I mean, why it took longer? Simply because the, home, the, the package didn't come, it was not reliable, the, 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 the postal service. Once that was sorted out, Italy love Amazon. There are parcels everywhere. I have to slalom in the take a slalom among parcels to get home now. Okay, the same with, uh, with home delivery, food and groceries and stuff. Uh, it's happening now. It's everywhere, especially younger people. My son is 29 and a dad now, and he's... Uh, and and Agatha's wife, uh, Agatha's mom, Benedetta, they 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 tend to you they ring up the, the supermarket and have everything delivered at home. And they are healthy, young, they could go there. No, they order. But that's interesting part of the answer is this, Tony. It's that there is oh now you have to be helping with that. Una saggezza preterintenzionale. <laughs> an almost, uh, well, preterintenzionale is a prior intention. intention. It's a, an almost, an almost um, unintentional wisdom. 
Okay, love. I think we'll go with that. I, if I had a little more time, I might be able. No, to unintentional that, right? wisdom. Italians are actually wiser than they think they are. So it, deep down, every Italian knows that they're having shops and not living and deserting city center. It's crucial. It's happening. The, the British the, in England and elsewhere, but especially in England, city center have been devastated by the fact that six o'clock everything is shut down. Mm. And and if you want to do, and especially old people, or simply during during the pandemic, everybody <coughs> has a big problem of people in their nineties. Put it this way, because all you could do is just to walk a few yards and buy something and go back home, mm. even if you were twenty five and 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 uh, and an athlete. Never mind the regulation. That was you had to do. So the importance of corner shops. Uh, shop became uh, obvious to everyone, yep. all people, for obvious reason. Younger people, and it's almost an ecological issue. Yeah, it's and people realize that you really need both. Why not home delivery? Ba ba ba. But the fact, and and they started to cater and to attend and to spend money because they realized the lip services was not enough and you really need to go sometimes and spend some money, otherwise the shop will die. Yep. And I tell you, there are millions of people doing that without any great plan or statement or whatever. They know that maybe it's a euro more, but the fact that if they cater and they provide uh, uh, they they guarantee the survive the survival of that shop, and Crema in my hometown is like that. Shops are everywhere; they're still there. They're actually how healthier than they were five years ago. Because well, I want, I want to life. weigh in. I want to weigh in with um, with just an, an observation on your first response about the writers, uh, the great Georgia author Flannery O'Connor, once wrote. Uh, remarking on the common observation that universities stifle writers. She writes, my opinion is that they don't stifle enough of them. There's many a bestseller that could have been prevented by a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think, that, I think we want to hear as many of your books, see as many of your books as we can. And I don't think there's any problem. I think the market does take care of it. That is the thing. Many, many books are written that nobody has the slightest interest in reading. I think that the things that you've written about Italy are, are fascinating. I do feel bad that we, we should probably give a few more questions from the audience a chance to be Yes, there. yes, possibly so. And I have to say that our console has a question. Thank you, Chiara. Right. Beppe, I was... Um, I found your comment uh, as, about reading as a form of playing very interesting that thinking and reading should be considered a form of playing. Um, how do we teach that to our kids? Because I have three, uh, three sons and they're in the teenagery, early 20s range. And uh, if I didn't inflict reading on them, um, hopefully, you know, as they grow, um, they will learn to love reading, but it's not that easy to, to teach children today or young adults the passion and, and how much reading can enrich their lives. Is there a recipe for that? Well, I can tell you what, uh, 22 years ago, back in 2000 in Seattle, Jeff Bezos uh, told me, uh, and he told me that Young people are like athletes, very good on short distances, 100 meters, 100, uh, 110 hurdles, 200 meters. And uh, they're very good because they are, they're fast and they can use all these sort of the social network. They, can, they, they are used to read fast, write fast, everything is fast. And... Uh, and they should be, and we should convince them that a good mental athlete can must run all distances, must be a, a, a sort of uh, a uh, sort of run the hundred, what is it, the mile or the fifteen hundred yard dash, or the 
and also the marathon. And the book is a way of teaching your brain to run the marathon. It's simply a different way of breathing mentally. Of course, if you tell this to uh, to your children or to younger people, do you know what they're going to do? Fall asleep immediately. You know, this convinced explanation, you may have liked it, what Jeff Bezos told me, but it doesn't work with teenagers. With teenagers, I think the only thing is work is to uh, try to, to understand there are books that are good at a certain age, there are books that should be forbidden before a certain age. Uh, I could mention several. Uh, I think if, if, um, if when you're 20, you read Moby Dick, unless you're very bookish, uh, you have a problem, you better go out and spend time with your friends, to be honest, it's too long. But a 40 is perfect, and so on and so forth. If you read... Uh, Mm, I read Don DeLillo at 40. I'm so glad I read it at 40 and not at 20. 60 is too old, 20 is too young. So teenagers, there are certain books and authors, not necessarily for children, even classic, that are good for them. And each one, each young person is different from the other. A good teacher and a good parent and a good friend should be able to realize what she or he uh, would like and that is the start and is, there is no general rule it, it does not exist my son thinks you know as he has grown up among books too many books too many books everywhere and he says that he has an allergy to books he says he's feeling physical allergy he says some people you know, I have allergies to what shrimps and I have allergies to books in fact I realized that he reads books he reads Harry Potter's, all of them. He, re he reads Stephen King. He reads, you know, he's found his niche. Very different from mine. So it's, uh, the teachers are important. I think many teachers simply uh, uh, suggest the wrong books. And I think three wrong books uh, when you are 13 and you're done with reading for a long time. Have I been blunt enough? I was looking, uh, if I may one. just weigh in, I saw a question from MC and it was addressed to me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up on that question if I may. It says to Anthony, what is the most difficult word expression to be translated from Italian into English? And there are many answers that I could give. Um, the thing is I love translating, I really enjoy it. And so, um, as a matter of fact, to go back to trains, Beppe, you were talking about trains before, I often say, and this is one of the reasons that I enjoy translating your work, uh, is that translating is like being uh, in, a, in, a, in a train compartment for a very, very long trip. And that could be a trip as long as from, uh, from uh, Milan to um, the far end of to Vladivostok, like the long train trip you took on the Trans-Siberian Express. So you hope that the writer you're going to be locked in that compartment with for a very long train trip is interesting and fun because you're really taking a trip inside of their mind on a very long voyage. But so I'll go to two different words. One of my favorite expressions that is so Italian is when you say, I have not the words, I am speechless. In Italian, the expression is, my arms fall off. Mi cascono le braccia, which means I can't speak, I can't even gesticulate. To me, that is one of the most beautiful uh, expressions for anyone to have come up with the idea, I can't even wave my arms in the air. Is, is that's just so wonderful. But there is only one word as far as I know from my experience. And I believe this is true for all languages, only one word that is truly untranslatable. And it is translatable, but it changes the word completely. Um, there are many words that you can explain. The portone, the uh, street door in an apartment house, that is something you can describe. 
It's where the carriage used to come in. The big doors open up to let in cars and one in the old days to let in a carriage with six horses. And um, then there's a little door and you can buzz it open and you go in that way. And there's a concierge, there's a portinaio and all of this. But the one word that's untranslatable is foreign. Because in Italian, foreign means not Italian. And you can translate it into English of straniero. You can translate it in English, but foreign means not English. And so the one word is right at the coal face between languages, meaning not us. And I just think that's interesting that every language is a little bit of a bubble and the rest of the world is outside of it. So that question made me think that is one of the, that's one of the answers I can give you. The other words that are difficult, they're not difficult, they're fun. You know, just foreign happens to be this metaphysical inversion where no matter what you do, it means something else in a different language. That's all. I just wanted to throw that in. Well, that's well, fabulous, my friends. Uh, I would like for Beppe to make, I don't know, a, a last comment. And we have so many, so many comments and uh, and a few more questions. One question very quickly is that some of us didn't understand how many countries you Beppe has visited. Is it 19? Is it 90? Is it 96? I mean, here in the chat, we are having a sort of a discussion. I, I think it's 98. 98. Okay. 98 for the Italians. 98. Okay. Wow. Wow. Fabulous. And, uh, can you uh, can we end reading a few more? Because I really, I mean, I I hope uh, that uh, in that compartment I was not a boring traveling companion. No, you Tony were not. Well. It definitely he was a lovely companion for me. I mean, it's great to work together on a book. Also, because I mean, his Italian is better than my English, but I I write and I speak English, as you can hear. It's so it's it's. Is a, is a bonus for both because we can argue and I, uh, I discuss and, and uh, negotiate. Of course, he's always right, but who cares? Uh, <laughs> but, but also but I have to say that the titles of each of the chapters are so much fun. Only, only the are. titles, right? Like, uh, okay, so because wine is a sentimental education and espresso is a truth. I mean, I, I love the titles. But yeah, please, we have an, a, another five minutes or so, and then we'll have to close. Uh, but uh, yeah, Anthony, uh, go ahead with another couple of these nice. Uh, well, let's go with statements. because in our parks we love what, strolling. What, what we'll do? Listen, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go look ahead. them up. Uh, I'm gonna look them up. We read one each. Okay, y you start. You decide where you want to start. Okay, I'm gonna go with 43. Okay, 43. Because okay. in our parks we love strolling relaxing and quarreling 44 because we are we've elevated complaining to an art form that's one of my favorite that is a beautiful beautiful observation because 45 because we love to baffle those who judge us 46 because we know that those who judge us who judge us are sometimes right 47, because if nobody's the same, it's hard to feel different. 48, 48, because occasionally we are speechless, but eventually we find the words. <laughs> 49, because we are what others would love to be, but don't dare. And that is me reading that, but it's an Italian writing it. 50, because we smile in spite of everything. And believe me, the everything nowadays is quite a lot, but Italians keep smiling. And I hope the book, I mean, every book must be useful. Useful because it's amusing, useful because you, it makes you think, be, useful because it gives you a new key to understand something, a situation or a country. So I do hope that Tony and I, brought out and put something useful that's my dream and i love to come back to in person to boston oh i miss 
I miss it so much. Two years without traveling for me, it was like, wow. I went to Germany to watch football, France once and Britain once. For me, it's like two years, nothing. All right, listen, this was so much fun and I, I'm really, you know, bummed because I have to, to, to close it. Uh, please check uh, imbooksboston.com for the Italian version. We have both versions. Um, and also check out our upcoming events. We are having a couple of in-person events this Thursday and this Friday. So, you know, it's a nice opportunity to, for us to, to get together in spite of the of the you know of covid so please beppe when you come to boston you're welcome to come and we can have you know a long meeting go out for dinner everybody all the italian community that would be so much fun thank you tony uh for you know entertaining us with all these beautiful questions and the consul general sereni thank you again for for supporting us all the time also to the Friends of Italian Cultural Center, Boston, thanks again for supporting us. All these events, we are having a lot, check them out, but thank you so much. Grazie di cuore a Beppe Severnini e a Tony Sugar per questo bellissimo evento. Alla prossima! Ah, I'm going to send you the chat to all of you guys so that you can you know before you go to bed you can read all these beautiful comments okay arrivederci Bye. arrivederci yeah. alla prossima Hello. goodbye and thank you and everyone I, I know for someone time. was watching us from melbourne australia so uh, rs thanks for melbourne best to you from us thank you we've had a lot of people coming thanks to you guys arrivederci e grazie Prego, arrivederci. Arrivederci.